chapter 6, verse 25 to verse 34, and then I'll pray. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body that you will put or what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you need, and you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day of its own trouble. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now and we want to center our hearts around you, center our hearts around Jesus Christ, the righteous one, the one that lived the life we should have lived, died the death we should have died, and rose again something we could not do. And God, I pray that we center our whole lives, wrap our whole lives around who you are, of what you want to do in our lives, what you want to do in this church, what you want to do in San Francisco. We want to follow after Christ, the crucified one, the one that comes in power, the one that is strong and mighty to save. We want to center our lives and, and, and everything around you. So would you help us this day in your name? Amen. So, um, I was praying this week, and we, uh, um, we're going through a sermon series, and it's actually going to be a year-long sermon series. It's going to be a series through the whole thing, but we're going through the year of biblical literacy, 365 days, 66 books, two testaments, one story, and we're going to be looking at the major story of Scripture. We're going to be looking at everything, and hopefully, you guys are still reading. I know some of you guys are like, Josh, I've been doubling up. Josh, some days I forget. And I hear you, and I feel it, and I know that we start with the greatest intentions in January 1st, right? And now that it's rolling around, what are we, January, is it 24th or the 23rd? We don't even know, right? It's like one of those days, and you're saying, God, what are you doing? I, I wanted to start out right, and I, I feel like I've lost track or whatever. And so what we've been doing, before we've gone even into the whole story of God, we've looked at why we should read the Bible. And there's a couple reasons, right? There was because Jesus read the Bible. Jesus loved the Bible. Jesus trusted the Bible. And because we love Jesus, we trust Jesus, that Jesus was a historical figure that has transformed our very lives... We trust Scripture. We love Scripture. When he points to Scripture and says, this is sustenance, this is good for growth, we look at it and we say, okay, because Jesus said this, I'm going after it. It's not because Scripture tells me about Jesus that I trust Scripture. It's because Jesus was actually alive, crucified, risen, 500 eyewitnesses saying, this thing happened. Three different public historian saying, yeah, something happened in Galilee and there was this guy named Jesus. What do you do with this historical figure named Jesus? And because we can trust him, this person that has changed history, we can trust his word. So the first thing that we look at is we say, okay, because of Jesus and scriptures, we can understand it. Then we looked at the purpose that comes in different phases, right? That, that we, we, we read scripture first for face value just to help us with our lives, right? We, 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 we say, you know, God, I'm just reading the Bible because um, it's going to make me into a better, more moral, better person, whatever, right? And so we look at the Bible as something that you know, I kind of use. And we look that there's different phases of that purpose that God actually wants us to go deeper 
and deeper and understand that the very purpose is not only for the sake of salvation, it is through the scriptures that we know that we are saved, right? But instruction of, 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 how we, of, of, of how we should be in a church context, how we should live our very lives, and for completion, right? For perfection. Not that we're going to become perfect, but we become mature into the thing that God always wanted, to be citizens of the kingdom of God. And it is through Scripture and the purpose of Scripture that not only do we understand salvation, not only do we understand the instruction of how we live in God's world, but we understand what we're supposed to be. I talked about little Lola, how she has all of the DNA in her to become the fully perfected adult. Right? She has it in her. Yes, I mean, she's going to be different with her personality and all of these different things. But for her to grow, it's all in there, all coded. For the Christian's life, it's all in there. It's all in Scripture. And as we feast on the Word of God, as we read the Word of God, not to just see our completion, but, be, but to be completed into the image of Jesus Christ. Right? So that's the thing. And then, then last week we talked about the Scripture's function. How do we actually use this thing? Right? Like, what, what are we supposed to do with it? And I, I was talking about how we can kind of look at it as two ways, right? The first way that we look at it is we, we, we look at it in the sense of meditating, chewing on, reflecting. There's like two types of praying, right? The, the first type of praying is um, the calling type of prayer, calling unto God, and He'll answer you. But I was talking about how whoever's kind of calling to God whoever starts the conversation kind of has power over what the conversation's about, right? God, I need help with my mortgage. God, I'm in a fight with, you know, my family member, my sister. I'm not in a fight with Jess, but I'm, I'm in a fight with this person. I'm mad. What should I do? And you look at scripture and you're, or, or you look at yourself and you say, you know, God, what, what should I do? And you pray and you start the conversation. And God's like, I want you to become more gentle and kind. And you don't hear him because you're too busy talking, you're too busy asking him, and he's saying, it's in my word. Then there's a prayer type of calling. Calling, or not calling, excuse me, answering. And how do we answer prayer? We read the Bible. When we read this book, it changes our perspective, and we start listening to God. The function of Scripture in our lives is for us to be renewed and strengthened. We talked about it for sustenance, right? What did the psalmist say? The psalmist say, a blessed is a man who doesn't go after other people's wisdom, but looks to the word of God. He'll be like a tree planted by water, drinking it in, right? And we talked about how water comes into a tree's roots and out, out comes not more water. What outcomes is, the outcome is what? Fruit, right? That's the beautiful thing that when I drink in the word of God, fruit is going to be coming out in my life. So we've been talking about that. And so I've been so excited in talking about why to read scripture and giving you all of the reasons. And I wanted to take a pause from everything before we get into it all and kind of check and take an assessment of how Golden City Church's heart is doing in this. Because if this thing becomes all intellectual and it becomes all about thinking and information, then, then it will never go the 10-inch drop from the head to the heart. If we're not looking to Scripture as transformation, as not just truth for information, but truth for transformation in our lives, and if we are not being convicted of sin, if we are not listening to the Spirit, then all of this is for naught. So I was thinking in, in, in my own heart, and I was seeking the Lord this week, and I was saying, what do I do? Because I'm on track with this thing. What, 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 what do I do, Lord? Like, I, I really did. I had this conversation and I said, you know, I don't want to get off track of what we're doing, but I really think that our church needs this kind of pro prophetic pause, this parenthesis within our big series of saying, what do you have for Golden City Church to learn? And I knew that we're all at this point right now that maybe some of your goals that you had already for the new year has already kind of dwindled off. I was going to work out more. Yeah, now I'm just eating more. You know what I mean? Like, it's already dwindled off. And so, just to recalibrate, maybe do a little restart, and letting you guys know that there is grace for you, that God has tons of grace towards you and loves you and cares for you and wants you to do that. So, I was thinking in my own life, and I um, always, there's always been a theme 
in, in, in my life. And for years, my favorite Bible verse has been Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these other things will be added unto you. It's always been something in my mind of, of knowing God. Um, when, I was a, when I was younger, um, a lot younger, when I was probably around five, five years old, my, my dad and, and, and my mom, every single morning would get alone with God. They would have the thing, Jessica knows it, couch time. And they would go to the couch and they would read, the, read, read their Bible with their morning cup of coffee. And we were not allowed to like interrupt like their time. It was their time. It was couch time. And we knew that we could not represent, you know, the kind of glory was like meeting my parents there as they're like reading the word together and getting alone with God. And so they would do this every morning. So for us, we would have to do that. We would have our own times with God. And of course, you know, as when you're a younger kid, it becomes law. Right? When your parents say, you know, have you do, done your devotions this morning? You know, you're like, okay, this is law. This is something that I have to do. But in my life, that was just what I did. So I would go, and, and a lot of my friends, like, they did not like me for this. So when I was younger, um, I would go and, you know, I would go spend the night at a friend's house, right? And, I, you know, younger boys, you know, they, they sleep in, right? That, that's like a thing that they do. Not me, up at five in the morning. Like, up at the five in the morning, and like, I would find, like, even people that, like, weren't Christians, I would find somewhere, like, their family Bible in the house, and I would, you know, the, like, the big ones, and I would, like, grab it. I would go to, like, a couch, and I would just start reading. And I, I didn't know what I was reading, but, but I'm like, I'm at this age. I was probably at this age, probably, like, nine, ten, like spending the night like at a friend's house, but I needed to read the Bible in the morning. And it would be funny because uh, um, the parents would like get up and they would see, they, they, would, they would be like, what is he doing? This like little kid with this huge family Bible on his, like on, on, on his legs, like trying to go through it. But I knew the importance of seeking God first, right? And in my mind, seeking God first was reading my Bible in the morning, devos, right? Devotions. Even though that we know that it's so much more than that. And because it has been a theme of my life, I was like, I want to share this with the church. I want to share how my upbringing and my life has been transformed by the Word of God. Transformed by the Word of God and seeing and kind of diving deeper into what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God. So let's get into the text right away. Let's see what he says right away. So Jesus is talking, and he's talking... Um, um, and he's speaking right here, and he says in verse 25, Therefore I tell you, and what does he tell you? What is the therefore? Well, you have to go to the verse above. The verse above is, you, can only, you can't serve two masters. You have to serve some, somebody. Either God or money, choose one. One thing you have to live by faith is the currency, and the other thing is money is the currency, right? And trusting in it by your own works, by your own way. So he says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Today, I want you to think about what you're anxious about. Think about what you're anxious about. There's so many things that you're anxious about. I'm anxious about so many things. So you're saying, well, he's giving me a command right now. Jesus Christ is giving me a command and saying, do not be anxious. And you say, Josh, what about, what about uh, my rent? You know, you know, you know, I, I don't know, like, I, I don't know if I can afford it. I don't know if I can swing San Francisco anymore. What about my rent? Should I be anxious about my rent? Josh, I, I, I don't know. I'm in a really, you know, I'm in a relationship right now, and we're not communicating well, and I'm, I'm really scared, Josh. I'm frustrated. I'm anxious. I, I, I want to do things better. I know I should be doing something more, and I'm not doing it. Josh, can I be anxious about that? Or maybe you're thinking about work. And it's, it's, it's hard at work, right? Like there's just a lot of people looking over your shoulder. Maybe you're new at work. Maybe you're going through something new. And you're trying to like, you know, get around it. And you're saying, I don't know if I can handle this. Maybe it's school. Can I be anxious about that, Josh? Well, let's see what Jesus says. Do not be anxious about your Life. Life is a junk drawer term of everything that you do while you are living. <laughs> okay? You have a pulse, you're breathing, right? Do not be anxious for it. So, three things. What are you seeking? Why are you seeking it? And why do you seek 
the living among the dead. So he goes on and he says, don't be anxious about your life. And then he gives you three what's. What you will eat, right? What you will drink, nor about your body, and what even you put on it. So he says, I don't want you to worry about the things that are going in your mouth. <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't worry about the things that are being covered around you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He goes on and he says, Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then he gives us a little illustration. I love this, right? He goes and says, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap. They do nothing, right? They, 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 do, they, they, they don't sow or reap. They do nothing to get their food. Just open their mouth. Nor gather it into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? We have a problem in the 21st century where we do not understand value. It's all relativism, right? It's all relative. I don't know. You're, you're valuable and you're valuable. How can I put a price on something? How can I put a price on the world? How can I put a price on this? Jesus is telling you that you are more valuable than birds that he feeds every single day and they sing his praises. You are of more value, Christian person, a person that is an image bearer of Christ, that gives you value, dignity, and worth, you're of more value. Don't be anxious about your life. It's a command. Well, what about this thing? No, don't be anxious about it. Because he goes into this thing and he says, you're going to be seeking a lot of things, fundamental things. Where am I going to eat? Where am I going to drink, right? We're always so dramatic here, right, in San Francisco. Oh my gosh, I'm starving, right? We use the highest forms, right, of speech and hyperbole in everything. When God is saying, don't you worry about your life. What about this, Josh? No, your whole life. You're breathing, he's saying, anything that is going in you, even the thoughts the motives, the things that you're scared about. Don't be anxious about your life. Isn't it more than just that? And see, we have to think of the context. See, you and I were like, I don't really care about food that much and drink and, and, and my clothing. Like, I, you know, I shop at this place or I shop that, like, you know, I'm not that big into it. Well, you have to consider the context. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the poor and the downcast. He's talking to Pharisees. He's talking to people that some of them didn't know where they were going to get their food next. Some people, predominantly Pharisees, that like to be whitewashed tombs or beautiful sepulchers, right? On the outside, they were beautiful with what they put on with their clothes, but the inside, they were like dead man's bones. He's talking to these people that would actually hear this and say, oh, that's a little bit more than me. But God is trying to get us at, the, at the, the, the center of our motives and the center of our lives and saying, you have hungers and you have thirsts and you have this great desire to be clothed. What does that remind you of? We're about to get into Genesis, right? What does that remind you of? Food, drink, and clothing. We look at Adam and Eve, right? The fruit of the garden was good to eat. They desired it. They wanted to eat it. They had this desire to be like God. Which is ironic because they were already made in the image of God. And then what does God do within their sin? He clothes them. Right? They were born naked and unashamed. We were naked and unashamed and our sin, deep, deep down, that it flowed from um, Adam and Eve and all the way down has broken us with a deep, deep depravity. Right? And so what do we see? We see God already looking for clothing. And why is it for us of the food and drink or where um, of what we do, it gives us the sense of value. But God is saying, look at the birds. The question is, is what are you seeking? If you are seeking comfort, if you are seeking basic needs, you have to understand that God already knows that you need them. He goes on in verse 27, he says, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Isn't that funny? 
I, I think that's like a, like, yeah, that's a good point, Jesus. Like, man, like, I, I can't add any more hours in my life. How many times this week have you said, there's just not enough hours in this day? There's not enough hours in this week. I, it is, the older that you get, the, the time clock just starts pouring down. And you're like, what is going on? Like, how is it Sunday already? Next, but by next week, you're going to be like here, and you're going to be like, what just happened? Like, did life just happen? Well, I, like, what? And God is saying, by you being anxious, he's like, you're already wasting minutes. <laughs> you're wasting minutes that you don't even have. How many times have you already done that? I know I've done it. I'm like, how are we already in January, January 23rd? This month has already gone by. We have 11 months now. You're like, good, Josh, you can do math. Great. Been known to be a mathematician. What are you seeking? And he's saying, even in the bare necessities, the bare essentials of life, right? You remember Baloo? Jungle Book, the bare necessities. The simple bare necessities. He says, in the very... If you strip away, strip away all of the fluff, do not be anxious. I'm going to make sure your stomach is fed. I'm going to make sure that your thirsts are quenched. And I'm going to make sure that you don't go cold. Sometimes you have to take those truths and bury them deep in you because any time there pops up an idol, any time idolatry takes root in your heart to where you think that you need more than what God is already offering you, you will be sure to be enslaved by possessions. You'll be possessed by possessions. This is the deep, deep truth that Jesus is trying to get to us. He is saying, don't be anxious. He says, you're anxious because you're not seeking me. What are you seeking? What to eat, what to drink, and what to wear. Jesus is saying to you, seek for more. Verse 28, And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. I love that. I love that. Jesus, Jesus is saying to us today, he's saying, don't worry, consider the lilies of the valley. Consider the lilies. He says, they don't do anything. They just, they just are. And look at all of their glory and their splendor. They don't seek to be pretty. They just are. I love this because he goes and phases and he says, here's the bare essentials. And he says, okay, here's the addition. And he says, don't worry. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And everything that you see with this beautiful thing, that there is a glory that was not arrayed like one of these for Solomon, God is looking and saying, there is no achievement that you can do to receive a good life. A life that is worth living. So why are you so anxious about it? I'm not saying that there isn't a good godly effort to produce and to talk, but when it comes down to it, when it comes down to the bare essentials, to the bare thing of our lives, when it comes to it, we realize that God already has and understands and does what he's going to do. And you say, well, then what do I pray, Josh? Why do I talk to God? Right? If he knows what he's going to already do and he's all-knowing and he's all-powerful, what do I do? Because he loves, he loves when his children grab his hand and say, let's do this, let's co-labor this together. It's a beautiful and amazing thing. See, we're so two-dimensional in our thought process when it comes to the Almighty God. Because what we look at him and we say, well, if he's going to do anything, then I'm just going to not do anything. He says, no, I, I want you to receive all of the good things. He says, all your steps are ordered, but I want you to walk in them. I want you to grab my hand and watch what he is doing. I want you to prevail. All the Puritans, they used to talk about this all the time. I love the Puritans. I love them because what they would do, Dr. David Brainerd, like, they, would, 
they would say, I know that God is going to do everything. I understand that God's going to do anything, but it is my great joy to persevere with him through it. I don't know what he's going to do through me, but I'm going to be listening. I'm going to be excited. I'm going to be moldable. I'm going to sacrifice my will for what he wills. I'm going to be a daily, I'm daily going to be sacrificing myself to Christ. And I think it's funny that, you know, one thing that's interesting about living sacrifices or sacrifices, if you could think about a sacrifice on like an uh, altar, is sacrifices, they don't keep moving, <laughs> right? They're dead and they're there, right? And they've been fully and completely surrendered. And in your life, you're going to constantly try to achieve things, try to do things, make things happen. God, you're working too slow. I like what a tool always says, right? God's delay is not always his denial, right? It's true. But God is calling us to say, be a living sacrifice unto me. Sacrifice your own agenda, your own things, and give them over to me. Verse 30, but if God so clothes the, gla uh, the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will, not, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? He's coming to this place and saying, what are you seeking in life? Okay, you're seeking just the bare minimum. He's like, I got you covered. Don't worry about it. Oh, you're, you're wondering how you're going to look in front of other people? Look at the lilies. They're beautiful. Look at the grass that only lives for a day. I clothe the grass that lived for a day. There today, gone tomorrow. I mean, the thing is, which is crazy, is your life is, as James talks about, is a vapor. Right? Your, your life is like something that you go by a really cold window and you go, ha! Ah, and you see the little vapor in there, and it disappears right away. Moses talks about this too. He goes and he says, God, teach us to number our days that we can apply them to wisdom. He is saying, your days are numbered. And just like the grass withers, he goes on to say, you wither and go away. And from one day you feel super strong, the next day, not so good, not so hot. But God says, I even clothe you in the hard times, the withering times, the times of suffering. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. In all of your seeking, whether it is people, right, relationships, friendships, times of just not being lonely, times of not just having something exciting going on in your life, whatever you're seeking, you're seeking and looking in the wrong place. You know that. I don't have to belabor that point. Verse 31, he goes and says, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. He goes on and he labors the point again. This is how Gentiles think. They only think about, about their stomach. They only think about their belly. They only think about their desires. They're Epicureans, right? They're living for their own desires. They're hedonists, right? They're only thinking about what they can consume, what they can consume, what they can consume. We do that too. In the 21st century, we think about only what we consu consume and we don't understand that the things that we consume are something that strengthens us so that we can give out to others for other people to consume. We only think about ourselves. And he is saying, do not be like the Gentiles that only seek after their own stomach, their own way. That's why Paul says their God is their belly. Because they only think about one thing, their own desires. Um, I was thinking about this kind of illustration and concept of, think about like a ball of yarn, right? You have this like ball of yarn, and I'm, in my mind it's a red ball of yarn. It could be a blue one in yours, but I have this ball of yarn. And when you kind of start life, once you kind of, you know, you, you my, my little brother's 18 now. He just turned 18. He was playing worship up here. And... You know, 
when you become like kind of owning your faith and owning your life, you start kind of saying, what do I want? What do I desire? You know, all my desires before was I was trying to please my parents, get good grades. I was, you know, trying to get, you know, you know, the next video game or something like that. Like, I, I didn't care much, right, when I was in high school. I didn't care much. You know, I tried to just please people. But now you start thinking of your own desires, and I think of desires as some big ball of yarn. And when you start out, you start going at it. And as you unravel the big ball of yarn more and more, you're excited and you're trying to see what's on the other side. And you're hoping that the end of the middle of the ball of yarn, that there is a key or something that will tell you this is what you've desired all of your life. And you start unraveling it and you start unraveling it and you start unraveling it. And I think of this a lot as a way of the Gentiles or people that don't believe that they have a heavenly father that has good plans for them that they just start unraveling and unraveling and doing all of these incredible stuffs in the wake, right? But they still, once they get to the mountain, money is just not enough. Relationship is just not enough. Family is just not enough. A bigger house is just not enough. Things are just not enough. And you start realizing, saying, well, all I really need is food in my stomach, my, my, my thirst to be quenched, and clothes on my back. That's all I really need. And that's why you see these guys that climb up the corporate ladder, and then they like, start saying, like, I really don't need this, and I really don't need this. They start kind of decluttering, and they think, like, I started my whole life to build myself to be up here, and then I looked at how lonely up there was, and I start trying to you know, un, you know, un, like, unclutter myself again. So I look at this ball of yarn and I think of it and I, I, I see the Gentiles and you, you have to ask yourself and say, what are you seeking? And for many of you, some of you guys are realists and you're like, there really isn't anything on the end there. And you could be either two ways. Work even harder at what you're doing. You know, you have this big mess of yarn and ball of yarn. You can get depressed about it. You could try to just work even harder. Trying to understand, well, well, what is this all mess? What does this all mean? Why am I seeking? Right? You start, you almost, you start out of, what am I seeking? All of these things. Now you're saying, well, why am I seeking? And now here's the beautiful thing. Verse 33, my favorite Bible verse. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So he first says, he says two things. He says, seek first. So he says, in everything you do, in every way that you live, in the morning, the first thing in your day, the first thing in your mind, in any decision that you make, the first thing that you do is you first seek the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Jesus is now explaining this concept and he is saying that the kingdom of God is the culmination of our lives. Did you know that? The, the, the culmination of your life, how your life ends, how your life is complete, is being a citizen within the kingdom of God. And you say, Josh, that's boring. Well, you're boring. What do you know? Just kidding. Kind of. The kingdom of God is God's righteous rule that all of the justice that you want to see in the world, all the compassion that you want to see in the world, all seeing the glory of God in this world, everything that you want to see, people in love, people happy, people excited, people at peace, a form of shalom, everything that you have ever wanted is within the kingdom of God. And he is saying, in everything that you do, seek the kingdom of God. Look for the kingdom of God. Search for justice. Search for humility. Search for walking with our God. There's so many things that are rattling your mind right now and you're freaking out and you're saying, Josh, if I start seeking things of God within my daily life, I won't eat. <laughs> I won't drink. I won't know what I can wear. And he's saying, stop it. Seek first me. And my kingdom. Because he says, I rule it all. He says, I govern the birds who don't even work for the food that they put in their mouths. And not only that, but they take the food and then they drop it and somehow it makes food for us and we, we get to eat it. He says, I did that. You know that little bird in the air that you just see as something that's like, whatever? We saw a hawk yesterday, a huge hawk, me and Zach, and we were like, it was in Coal Valley somewhere, and it was just like hanging out on, on a hillside, and it was huge. Zach got a little snap picture of it, and I looked at it, and I was like, oh my goodness, that's like glorious. It was like a big hawk, and 
I was like, man, that's like, that's amazing. But even the little birds, even the pigeons that you just don't like, right? The flying rats, we call them, right? Gosh, those things are gross, you know? Missing a leg, one eye's gone, poor pigeons. Except when you go to France, right? And then you're like, I don't care about pigeons, right? But look up a YouTube where they capture pigeons. It's not very nice, um, but it's crazy. But God cares even for those things. How much more value are you? And he's saying, seek first my kingdom and put yourself under my rule and under my reign. Read the Bible in the morning and saying, God, what is your kingdom telling me? How should I live? Because we live within two kingdoms, right? We, we live within the kingdom of man right now. That is, right? It's present. It's fading away. It's breaking down. Just look at the political system right now. It's all going crazy. Right? Things blowing up. I, you know, it's, it's just crazy. We're already seeing it fade. And his kingdom, the one that is higher, the one that is greater, the one that is over it all, he's saying, look at the small things. You think it's crazy about Nero and all the things? Nero's on my shoulders. Don't worry about it. <laughs> he goes, why are you seeking I look at John 135, it goes and says, The next day again, John was standing with the two disciples, and he looked at Jesus, and he asked, and uh, walked and said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God. This is John the Baptist. And he looks at his two disciples, and the two disciples go and follow Jesus. In verse 38, it says, Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? I want to go hang out with you. I want to see where you live. And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew. Andrew is an interesting person in the Bible because Andrew's always bringing people to Jesus. He brought the little kid with the, the, with the few loaves uh, uh, of, of bread and fish and he brought him to Jesus and said, hey, this is the guy. G Andrew was the guy that was always bringing people to Jesus. I love this. And who does he bring? Peter. <laughs> A person that's seeking, a person that says life must be more than just fish. So they came and, excuse me, so he goes in verse 41, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the anointed one. We have found Christ, the one that is bringing the kingdom of God. He brought him to Jesus and Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, you shall be called Cephas. He gives him a new name and a new identity. He is saying to you today, as you seek first the kingdom of God, as somebody brought you here today, or God brought you to here today, God is saying, come and see, what are you seeking? He asks weird questions. He doesn't ask you what you know. He asks you what your desires are. What are you seeking? We want to see where you live. I'm sure it wasn't a palace, right? We know this. It says, fox have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And they're like, that's the king. <laughs> that's the king of all, right? Because that's what he was. He said, this earth is my kingdom. The king was already at home. And we look at it and we see them saying already, what are you seeking? The problem is that human imagination... This is Sam Wells saying this. Human imagination is simply not large enough to take in all that God is and has to give. We are overwhelmed. God is inexhaustible, God's inexhaustible creation, limitless grace, relentless mercy, enduring purpose, fathomless love. It is just too much to co contemplate, assimilate, and understand. This is the language of abundance. And if humans turn away, it is sometimes out of a misguided but understandable sense of self-protection, a preservation of identity in the face of a tidal wave of glory. I want to say the last part again. And if any humans turn away from all of this limitless grace, all of this relentless mercy, all of this enduring purpose, all of this fathomless love, stuff that is just too much for us to, to assimilate or to contemplate or to understand, if we ever turn away from it, it is out of a misguided but understandable sense of self-protection. Why are you anxious about your life? Because at one point, you're saying, I don't know, I don't know if God 
has my back, so to speak, and can clothe me and feed me and all things. There's that point. But there's also, God promises so much that it frightens us to go after tamer things. Money's a lot easier to do. I'll just do it myself than have to actually trust God to bring something in. I'm just going to do it myself. I don't want to relinquish control. Your anxiety comes from the sense of trying to be too, con too in control, where you don't believe in, in anything, any God, right? That he's in control. Or it's because you are too comfortable and you're in too love with your own control. It comes from two spots, right? Right? It's either God isn't in control, so I have to be in control and I'm trying to protect myself. Or God is so in control of everything and I don't like him kind of getting in my way or listening to him. And I love, I love, self, I love my own kind of control of my life. He says, don't be anxious. You are going to present yourself with so much anxiety. So more than seeking for things of earth, more than seeking for your own kingdom to come and your own will be done, Jesus is looking for us today and he's saying what? He said, seek first the kingdom of God and he says, and his righteousness, right? The right things that he would done, the right things that he says, this is what glorifies me. Seek me today. I think of all the times that I have failed to seek God. All the times that I have sought my own pleasure. One of the old church fathers said this. He said, In this lay my sin, that not in him, but in his creatures, myself and the rest, I sought for pleasures, honors, and truths, falling thereby into sorrows, troubles, and errors. I look and I look at other men that have gone before us and we say that even us looking at all of these things that we can say that is what we're seeking for we understand that the reason why we are seeking for it is a sense of deep deep insecurity and self-protection and not believing that God will protect us and then lastly, lastly we look and say why do we seek the living among the dead he says um Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things will be added unto you. All of these things, all of the things, all of the bare minimum of life that you think that you need, it will be added. Stanley Hauerwas says, the problem, or the be beautiful simplicity of the life to which Jesus calls his disciples is equivocally elicited by Jesus' directing our attention to the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. Possessed by possessions, we discover that we cannot will our way free of our possessions. But if we can be freed, our attention may be grasped by which is so true, so beautiful, we discuss, discovered we have been dispossessed. To seek first the righteousness of the kingdom of God is to discover that for which we seek is given and not achieved. I'm going to read that again. To seek first the righteousness of the kingdom of God is to discover that for which we seek is given and not achieved. The beautiful thing about the word of God is that you have it in your hand today. And you can think that I have to figure out my own righteousness. I have to figure out my own kingdom and my own world and my own will to really have something happen. And with that comes tons and tons of anxiety. What are you seeking for today at Golden City Church? What are you seeking for? Just a moment, a pause, maybe another breath? Why are you seeking for all of these things when they're already provided to you? God is saying, I have given you everything. Why do you seek the living among the dead? You, you see in John's Gospel, or excuse me, not John's gospel, in Luke's gospel, Luke 24, we see this concept of Jesus is coming and the, the, the people um, are running to the tomb, right? The women are running to the tomb to kind of bring out some, check if the Lord's still there. And they go there and they are revealed by angels and saying, why are you seeking the living among the dead? Right? They went to the wrong place. Right? They went to the tomb where Jesus said, I will die and then I will be resurrected. Why do you seek the living among the dead? 
So one of the reasons why we have such anxiety is sometimes we believe that Jesus is dead. We believe that he has no power, that he is not alive, that he's not changing our lives. We believe that his power, his rule, his reign has nothing to do with our lives. Sometimes, as Christians, we're practical atheists that, yeah, God, I know that you're up there, but practically I'm going to live my life like you did not rise from the dead with the Spirit of God. We do that all the time. I am guilty of that constantly, and God is calling us to something deeper, and he's saying, why are you seeking the living among the dead? And this is the funny thing. You remember that ball of yarn that I was thinking about with you guys, giving you a little thought experiment? And we're searching, 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 and we're seeking, seeking, seeking. And the world's telling me that I, you know, the, the, at the end of that, that ball of yarn, as you keep on seeking through something, that there better be something there, there better be something of worth, there better be something of value, there better be something. And you get to it and you say, there's nothing there. The only thrill I had in my life was thinking that there was something there. And we kept on going, and we kept on seeking, and we question our reasons why of what we're seeking for. And you know what God does? He says, why are you seeking? Why are you seeking the living among the dead? And he says, this is the thing. I take this ball of yarn, and I start, we I start weaving it into a tapestry along with all these other broken people and all these other people that had these lives that thought they were going through all these things and finding it was nothing. He says, I take all of these balls of yarn, and I start making it into a beautiful tapestry for my kingdom, my good. You thought your work was the thing that you wanted so much, and you wanted all this recognition, and you're saying, man, my job was the thing that was at the end. And you're saying, I got to the end, and it wasn't that. And God was saying, no, I was using your job. I was using your job for this beautiful tapestry. Tapestry. You said, no, my family, that was the thing that I wanted, and I got to the thing, and I still felt empty, and you said, no, I wanted to use your family for my work, and for my world, and for my kingdom. He's saying, while you seek first the kingdom of God in everything that you do, what you're doing is you're helping build his kingdom, build his reign on earth as it already is in heaven. What we do so much is we become anxious and say, I am seeking for something, and there better be something. And he's saying, why are you seeking when you are found? It is not you that is seeking, but it was me that was seeking for you. Will you be found today? Will you be a person that is reading this Bible, not necessarily to seek something out, but to be found by a God that loves you and wants to pour out his grace to you? Look at this. He goes on and he says this. I love this. Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and he sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, value, went and sold all that he had and, brought, and bought it. What God is saying is, I have given all things. Jesus Christ, the, the Savior, he left the throne room of heaven, right? All the luxuries, all the food he could eat, all the drinks that would quench his thirst, all the fine. They talk about this, right? In Isaiah, the robe of God fills the temple with glory, this beautiful thing, and he takes off the robe, he takes it off, and he puts it aside, and he becomes a man. And not only that, he leaves his kingdom, and he has nothing but the dirt under his feet. Rocks is his pillow. And he gives up all of these things. Why? Because you're not searching for God, and you're not searching for what you really need in life. He is searching for you. And to the degree that you believe that God every single morning saying, I want to get time with you. The reason why I want you to seek first of the kingdom of God is when you wake up, I want to be the first thing that you see and the last thing that you see. Today, if you think reading your Bible is about moral, you know, just, just, just this idea of, you know, moral achievement or because you want to be good, throw it all aside and say, it's because I just want to seek him, the one who sought me out. He says in Luke 15, or what a woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not, uh, does not, uh, uh, does she not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before angels of God over one sinner who repents. God is throwing over tables for you today. And he is saying, thank you for seeking me and my kingdom and my righteousness. He says, all the things will be added unto you. 
Do not be anxious about your life. Let's pray. God, I, I, I think this was, I pray this was something that people would take deep into their hearts, into their souls. It's so easy to get caught up in the rat race. It's so easy to get caught up in things that, that just don't matter. Our lives are gone so quickly and I pray that we would look and learn that all of our achievements, Lord, are not so that we actually come to the end and finally find out what our deepest passion is. But at the end, the emptiness is only satisfied by you. And that all the things, all the good things, family, relationships, marriage, all of those things, work, school, they're good things. But they're a ball of yarn that in those things in and of itself will just totally destroy us, sadden us, break us. But I pray that we would come to the very end of those things. I pray that when we come to the very end of our faith, our minuscule faith, and, and either not God at all and just in the things in our possessions, or if we have like a half in, half out thing of we kind of trust God here, but we have our foot over here. God, I pray that you would rip that away from us. I really believe that is a faith worth losing. A half faith is a faith worth losing. And I pray that they would fling themselves into the everlasting arms of our loving Christ. In your precious name, amen. We have communion elements here. Um, as a family, we take them every week. And I hope this would remind us that Jesus left heaven and clung to the cross. And he thirsted for us. He became hungry for us. Right? His ball of yarn, you go all the way through his ball of yarn, God used his hunger and his thirst and his brokenness so that we would be filled and never hungry again. That we could drink deep of the wellspring of life and we'll never be thirsty again. That our body that was broken could be put together. Let us see that today.